All right. So we're starting a new subject today, and it's it's a first class for for many of you. Uh, the subject that I'm starting with is called behavioral finance. Um, behavioral finance is you know is a fantastic introduction of what level three is all about, right? So if you want to get a flavor of what CFA level three is, I think behavioral finance is just the just the perfect place to start. I generally like to start uh, behavioral finance sessions with uh, an interesting game. Keep it on, put a pin on it with an interesting game. We're going to do it together. Uh, we, we're going to play a, a small, small game. Uh, the game will work like this. Uh, some of you, you know, might have done this with me before. Some of you are probably doing it for the first time, but let's say it'll be fun. Let us say that I lock you guys into a room. Listen to me carefully. It gets very interesting. Let's say I lock you guys into a room and uh, I give you two choices. Okay. One, uh, you either pay me $500 and then you're good to go. Okay. So just pay me flat $500 and, you know, leave simple, as simple as that. Or second, uh, we'll do a flip of coin and depending on the outcome, depending on whether you win or I win. If, if you win, you go free, right? So you don't have to pay anything, but if you lose, you might have to pay, let's say $1,050. Okay. So in one instance, you have to pay me $500 and then you, you know, you're good to leave $500 is like 35 or thousand rupees. Now a little bit more now, right? Current exchange rate. So you pay me, you leave or, or you do a coin toss. And if you win, you go free. And if you lose, then you have to pay a little bit more, right? 1050 is what I told you. Now let's call option A and option B. Option A is you paying me 500 and option B is you doing the coin toss. I want each one of you to make a pick. What do you think you want to choose? A or B? <laughs> choose what comes to you instinctively. Choose what comes to you instinctively. Uh, what do you think? What is your heart saying? Do you feel like paying me $500 or do you want to, you know, do a wager? And this experiment was done, uh, you know, like a lot of that. That's the best part with behavioral finance, right? It's like you, we could do a six month course on this reading. It's, is that interesting? They keep on doing experiments in different colleges and, you know, keep on doing different tests. So they, this was actually a test done on a bunch of, bunch of people. And what, what a lot of people said is they said that they would choose option B. Okay. And just let's evaluate the outcome, right? So in case of A, you had to pay $500 fix. In case of B, you do a wager. So you do a flip of coin, a flip of coin. Now in a flip of coin, what's the probability of either winning or losing? 50%, right? So at 50%, you need to pay $1,050 and at 50%, uh, you pay zero, right? So there's a 50, 50% probability on either direction. Now, mathematically, if I just decide to take an average of it, uh, how much is my expected payout? How much is, how much do you think is my expected payout here? It's $525, right? So it's, it's basically saying on a probability adjusted basis in one case, you have a hundred percent payout probability of 500. In other case, you have a payout amount of 525. Which one do you think is more logical to choose out of these? Yeah. The logical to choose is to optimize in the given situation, right? That's what a rational person will do. But how do we, you and I as individuals behave, we have a tendency of something called as a loss aversion. Okay. Now traditional finance taught us risk aversion, behavioral finance teaches us a really cool concept called loss aversion. What's a loss aversion? This is a certain loss, right? And this is an uncertain loss. Let me give you a real life example it happens to us all the time. It is also a little bit linked to something called as a regret aversion. Okay. But let me give you an example. You'll probably relate with this. Has it ever happened to you that, uh, you bought a stock. Uh, you made a mistake or you made some investment, you made a mistake and uh, the value of the stock, the value of the stock, you know, went down 30, 40, 50%. And uh, the logical thing for you to do is because of certain, you know, certain reasons, you should be selling the stock. 
but do you think there is a tendency for us to kind of you know sit on those losses and not book losses maybe maybe average out and hope for a uh, stock price to recover do you, have you ever experienced this yeah right because like we as humans we we kind of built that way right that's how our brain brain works uh, that there is a tendency to avoid certain loss the moment i sell my loss making position it basically means i have to bite the bullet and i have to accept that i made a mistake right but if i'm sitting on it maybe you know <laughs> yes see that that is why a lot of traders end up becoming long time uh, you know long term investors uh, how many stories i should i tell you started out career as a trader uh, ended up becoming you know long term investor still waiting still waiting for uh, yes bank to recover <laughs> right so that's that's your loss aversion right that's behavioral finance uh, what what are the things we do okay let's do the same flip of coin now let's invert the situation let's say you've locked me into a room that's a more likely scenario because you are in larger capacity today so you lock me into a room you say you know what utkash uh, uh, now this time around let's reverse it uh, or i would say that okay let's reverse it i will either pay you uh, a fixed fixed 700 Okay, you take seven hundred dollars. Do whatever you want. Go buy yourself a nice, whatever you can buy in seven hundred dollars, uh, or we'll do a, a you know coin flip, and then we'll do fifty fifty. Uh, so I'll give you let's say fifteen hundred dollars. So either you take seven hundred dollars with me from me in cash and leave the room, or you do the coin toss. Let's call it A and B again. What do you think? A and B. Where do you want to go? What is your instinct saying? Do you want to take the seven hundred dollars or do you want to do the coin toss? Yeah. So again, the instinct will say, uh, you know, instinct will say that take seven hundred dollars. Why? Why does the instinct say take seven hundred dollars? Like heuristic, right? You're without even thinking, you feel like. you know you feel like let me take 700 dollars because because this is uncertain right i don't know what will happen maybe i'll win maybe i'll not but again if you do the maths 50% at 1500 and 50% at at 0 what's your average expected payout here again mathematically what you want to see is mathematically what you want to see is uh, 750 is a better outcome right so here a lot of us should have chosen b and we are finance people this is level 3 class we've been studying finance for all our lives uh, but but again the instinct says you know what you're getting 700 dollars fixed uh, you know why not take it right just take it and uh, you know move on why do why do you want to do a wager so when it came to losses an individual will prefer an uncertain loss rather than a certain loss but when it comes to gains uh individuals will prefer certain gains over uncertain gains right what's what's a more uh, real life example of this L- let me do a survey with you how many of you uh, how many of you cfl level 3 candidates have a have a fixed deposit in a bank uh, let's say more than maybe let's say about 20% of your wealth or more than 20% of your wealth so i re- again a uh, few years ago right quite some time back pre covid um, i had gone to this cfa institute conference in mumbai so there uh, some lady had come you know some speaker had come she was doing session on something like this she had asked people this question that how many cfa charter holders uh, have fixed deposit and a large number of cfa charter holders raised their hands there right and have you interacted with clients and have you seen that their decision to put money in fd is frictionless frictionless means it's like an almost an instant decision uh, you have some cash okay let's put it in a fixed deposit in a bank right why why is that why is there such a low friction with putting money in fd uh, psychologically 
but why there is such a large friction with the uh, large friction with putting money in other asset classes let's say equity there's a friction right with decision making and that i think happens because when you put money in ft there is certainty of gains here right you know that you at least hope that you're not going to lose money most of the people don't even you know don't even re realize that even banks have some great risk but they feel that you know what it's it's a certain gain i'll get my 5% 6% whatever but my money will remain there right so there is no mental uh, there are not too many frictions in decision making process again you know that's a classic behavioral finance how many times have you noticed that people uh, open up their bank accounts with the uh, with the bank which is closest to their house now of course we are living in an internet world but have you ever encountered situation where uh, you choose a bank because it's there's a branch available in your locality nearby senior citizens yeah correct that's again a bit because that's not how you want to take that decision right you want to put some thinking behind it because you're putting in your money <laughs> uh, but people do that how many times uh, have you seen that if uh, you get a client through a referral there's a higher probability of converting a client rather than getting a you know client lead from let's say internet especially those of you who are in private wealth referrals convert fast that's an availability bias it's a bias i'll tell you why because with referrals the level of friction is being reduced correct so yes trust Uh, but ideally the decision should happen based on evaluation of all the metrics rational economic man that's tradition that's what traditional finance taught us what did harry markowitz taught us right optimize risk and return plot it on a graph build a fancy excel file level 3 behavioral finances that's all bs yeah okay fine in an excel file it's good you wrote a research paper you got a nobel nobel award for it fantastic we are very happy but that's not how people are right people are different beasts i can keep on giving you examples um uh, let me tell you uh, my example you tell me if you have ever encountered this uh let us say that you want to buy yourself you know an expensive what do you want to buy let's buy expensive watch let's you want to buy yourself an expensive watch no car nahi watch okay let's say an expensive watch now expensive uh, you know is debatable but let's say you want to buy yourself a watch now uh two scenarios okay so let's say the watch is uh watch is let's say $10000 okay now scenario number 1 uh, you really like that watch uh you know you uh, took $10000 in cash uh, who does that today right but let's say you have $10000 of cash uh you go out to watch uh, you go out to purchase the watch but uh, you know some mistake happens and you end up losing that money okay maybe it's stolen right or maybe you were mugged on the way or whatever so you lose that $10000 you have cash with you now if you want to really want to buy the watch what you'll do is uh, you will go back home uh, get another $10000 go to the watch store get the watch that's scenario a scenario b uh you take your $10000 you go to the watch shop you purchase the watch and then uh when you you haven't opened the watch you purchased it you took it out of the store and when you were crossing the street you were mugged right and the watch is gone now if you want to buy the watch again you go back home get $10000 go to the watch store and get the watch in which scenario do you think people are most likely to buy the watch again scenario a losing the cash or scenario b losing the watch the the research was done and what they realized is that people are more likely to purchase the watch or purchase whatever and i have experienced this myself in scenario a as against scenario b right why is that uh, because when you're losing money or you're losing a watch there's a sense of regret right now psychologically where do you place your regret do you place your regret on the cash or do you place your regret on watch in the second scenario if you lose the watch then your regret uh, memory formation is associated with the watch right and therefore they discovered the probability of the probability of uh, people buying the watch 
in the second scenario is lower compared to uh, probability of people buying rebuying the watch or buying the watch in the first scenario again because mathematically if you think about it they're equivalent the watch which was worth 10000 now is going to cost you 20000 end of the story it's it's as simple as that once money is gone it doesn't matter whether money is gone in cash or the money is gone in the form of watch right the money is gone money is gone so mathematically those two options are equivalent but again uh, users will have different behavior depending on what they experience again that's behavioral finance right and we can keep on doing this we can keep on doing this forever okay here's the last one uh, this is from my one of my favorite books of uh, an author called robert chal chaldini uh, he's written a book called psychology of influence uh, to me that book is probably as good as uh, you know the thinking fast and book which is daniel kahneman i'll be showing you those books uh, but here's a cool example <clears throat> do you think investors get influenced by people who sound little authoritative on television like fund managers who come and give interviews on television and they sound really smart and therefore that drives their decision making uh, drives their uh, decision to invest into that fund do you think that's true like some influential fund manager coming on television and saying but think about it these are different skills this is different skills right being able to speak well and being able to manage uh, and research well not necessarily are the same thing so i might be a great speaker but i might not be a fund manager so i should be evaluated i should be evaluated based on i should be evaluated based on my ability to research and purchase the and purchase the right set of stocks rather than my ability to you know go and influence people right but apparently that's not how industry is working so here's a cool experiment that was done by the same author robert, robert chaldini so what he did is uh, in the us they take uh, the zebra crossings very seriously right so they did this in some uh, state i mean i'm sure in in new york they give a f about it but in you know some of the other cities they take that zebra crossing seriously so typically uh, even uh, you know walking through uh, walking through the road like on the pathway right zebra crossing uh, there are signals for uh, people who are pedestrians like people who are walking there are signals for them so there is a red signal and then there is a green signal right so clearly you're supposed to just walk so what they did is uh, there were a bunch of people waiting at the same location at same time of the day and they sent one hipster there okay and uh, everyone was waiting in the line right because they want to cross the zebra but they're waiting for the green signal to come but the hipster basically uh, you know kind of broke the signal and he started walking and he started walking and then couple of other people uh, simply started following him happens like if one person does it uh other people also have a tendency to do have you ever noticed this noticed how on traffic signals uh there is always this one guy who starts and then everyone else you know start <laughs> start following and it's it's global it's not indian starts me it's human right it's it's human one person does it it's it becomes either that's a herding behavior right humans are we are basically just you know fancier version of monkeys right so we have the herding behavior but here's the cool thing this experiment now continued and what they did is now same time same signal some other day they basically got a guy who and put him in a business suit right uh, you know gave him nice clothing uh, and you know he smelled nice and everything and then they kept him uh, and then they kept him at the signal and he broke he also broke the the signal and he also started walking on the zebra crossing and they did this multiple times and they realized that every time this you know business looking person when he broke the signal more number of people followed him rather than the previous hipster so otherwise the people who were waiting patiently in the line uh, you know suddenly their behavior changed when they when they saw this person who's you know wearing business clothing decided to uh, cross the signal that's again signaling Uh, as humans we are always looking for certain signals to make our decision making easier okay so wearing nice clothes or this it just amplified you know the herding behavior even more okay uh, i had an interesting debate about someone recently uh, i met 
i met a individual investor who's who's very popular but he's managed to keep his uh, personal uh, size of the portfolio secret okay so i basically asked him uh, do you get do you get a lot of people uh, when you keep on posting on social media and everywhere do you get a lot of people who come and ask you what is the size of your portfolio and he said yes uh, people do that but how does that matter you know i'm doing the research work i'm giving them the thesis if they like it good if they don't like it it's okay uh, do you think it matters uh, when someone is posting about a stock do you think it matters to you if you know the size of their portfolio like someone posts someone is putting up an intelligent analysis right really well thorough research report but if you know that the person has x amount of size of the portfolio do you think that will influence your decision again signaling right <laughs> again signaling right uh, so again we are we are constantly picking up these cues from our environment so i i told him this i told him like um, if you observe animal kingdom uh, and i learned this in i learned this in some book i don't remember i think adaptive markets or somewhere if you observe uh, animal kingdom and you look at lions okay which lions get the maximum uh, mating opportunities like which lions made the most which which lions uh, made the most the ones with the biggest mane right those the it's called mane right the the hair that the lions have now biologically those means that the 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 lions have those consume a lot of lot of calorie and calories are precious right and you know in the animal world you're always fighting for getting the calories so calories are precious so then here is a lion who's basically signaling that hey i have a lot of extra calories i can afford to burn them and that ability to burn you know extra calories provides a signal to the female lions that you know maybe this is a more attractive male lion to me right probably the reason why we instantly trust an individual if he's wearing business clothing or if we trust an individual a little bit more uh, because you know maybe individual is driving an expensive car again all of this uh, becomes a part of your behavioral finance so it's a fantastic subject uh, you know we can keep on doing this but hopefully you get some uh, some flavor of where we are heading with this all right uh, so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to get started with the session i've built a presentation uh, for you and i'll be taking you through this part and then we'll be practicing a few questions on it would there be an arbitrage opportunity arbitrage in terms of what arbitrage in terms of in term like how arbitrage how in terms of gains to be made you're saying based on behavioral biases yeah see i don't think there will be arbitrage arbitrage because you know the theoretical definition of arbitrage is riskless profit so we don't know if you are you know talking arbitrage arbitrage but there are certain hints you can pick up you know for example you know that humans have a herding behavior right so uh how many times we experienced in the last 2 years i'll tell you herding behavior it caught to a lot of people um let's say stocks like uh, stocks like your happiest minds did you experience that moment where happiest minds is an indian it company uh did you experience like everyone talking about the stock and everyone wanting to get a piece of it or tata elexi last year uh so many stocks adani fantastic yeah adani you know adani lately so there is a herding behavior right and uh, even fund managers exhibit herding behavior so maybe if you are aware of behavioral finance you know what people do and you know if then and you also know how you tend to react so that might help you improve your uh, decision making process a little bit does behavioral finance and efficient market hypothesis have contradictory views yes uh, absolutely uh, because again efficient market hypothesis does you know talk about uh, absolute efficiency and rational behavior in the market uh, you know which is basically where uh, behavioral finance starts and you know say you know what it doesn't happen right so this is your book guys right so if you want to learn 
more about behavioral finance and really have fun with it and this is an advice for candidates who are writing in feb uh, 23 if you're writing in may uh, don't even think of it if you're writing in august maybe you can spend some time on this book but yeah if you want to kind of read and learn and enjoy behavioral finance it's a fantastic book the great thing with this book is it's it's hilarious like it's it's very humorous uh, very witty there are tons of jokes uh, you know and the author keeps on throwing one joke after another at you so you not even feel like you're reading a book it's just you know like listening to a stand up comedy show of sorts so if you get a chance do do read this book with this i'm going to get started with the session we'll at least do you know a little bit today just to get things started so there are two types of uh, two types of errors or biases that humans have right something called as a cognitive error and then something which is more of an emotional response so something is an emotional bias okay now cognitive error what you need to know is that we do this error instinctively uh, at times maybe without realizing it but once these errors have been identified and if someone tells us that you know what you're doing this you need to be a little more careful you have a tendency to do this so with proper training you know proper education these errors could be solved to a large extent so cognitive error is something that people do but they're solvable type of errors emotional biases you know are very deeply rooted human behavior right and these are the ones which are very very difficult to solve like there are tons of biases and we do those all the time anchoring bias this bias that bias so there are ton of tons of different biases and these are very very difficult to solve so the way this reading spreads out is it first teaches us what's a cognitive error what's an emotional bias it builds a background and then it starts listing down each of the cognitive error each of the emotional bias and we start you know uh, digging into that particular uh, section so let's look at a little bit of theory now so traditional finance focuses on traditional finance focuses on how individuals should behave right more like a prescriptive type of thing uh, it's like optimize risk return behavior you know try to find that point on the efficient frontier which has the highest slope and all that stuff it assumes that it assumes that people are rational it assumes that people are risk averse okay i just told you risk averse is actually a, a nicer word for rational but risk averse means doesn't mean i'm not going to take risk risk averse simply means if i'm taking risk i want to earn some return for it right so that's rationality and selfish utility maximizers selfish utility maximizers who act in their own self interest without regard to social values unless the social values increase their own personal utility for example esg today right uh, why why is esg attracting so so much of money i think that's also a little bit of herding behavior that uh, you know some investors started doing esg because they genuinely believed in the esg cause right and now there are a lot of funds which are coming up in esg because now they know that there are ton of these investors who believe in esg and because they are buying that buying is kind of you know pushing the stock prices upward so for me it's a financially smart thing to do to follow esg now right so that's your selfish utility maximizers what's a utility uh, if you guys remember in cfa level 1 we actually built a mathematical formula to calculate utility uh re expected return minus half into variance into risk aversion score uh it's crazy right how how finance can try to quantify something which is so uh un unquantifiable of sorts right utility means the benefit you derive out of uh, you know something so it's the pleasure or satisfaction uh, obtaining from you know consuming good service or making an investment so then there comes comes the concept of rational economic man uh, you know which is every time i read this it reminds me of uh, i i don't know why but it remind like it reminds me of something let me show you uh, which is that movie of uh, shahrukh khan where he is a different character in the first half of the movie and different character in the second half with 
अनुष्का शर्मा आई गेस हाँ करेक्ट या सो दिस इज या दिस इज माय इमेज इन माय मेंटल इमेज फॉर नो ऑब्वियस रीजन आई डोंट नो व्हाई व्हाई आई थिंक ऑफ इट दिस वे but i do do think of it this way right a rational economic man is a small sharukh khan sitting in your presentation anyways which will lead to efficient market uh, prices accurately reflect all available relevant information traditional finance is concerned with normative analysis normative means you know like building some sort of norms like you know do this do that optimize you know a solution Uh, and so on it uses a prescriptive analysis uh, it says you know this is what you should do practical tools and method behavioral finance to a large extent even today is not mathematical right so it's still a developing area it's not that you know we've completely figured it out we're still learning right but behavioral finance is still descriptive we still you know we still uh, learning about ourselves we haven't figured out our brains yet right there are so many things that we still do not know about humans so we still figuring this out but it's a intersectional or a cross sectional area of traditional finance psychology adaptive economics and neuroeconomics so it's a multifunctional multifunctional area and again neuroeconomics has been used to look at decision making under uncertainty drawing on studies of brain chemistry studies of brain chemistry to understand how decision making utilizes both the rational as well as emotional areas of the of the brain 